Welcome back to The Real Estate Sit Down. This is episode 40. I'm Blair Berg. This is Amber Perez. How are you doing, Amber? I can't believe we're on episode 40. I know. I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm doing well. Yeah, no, I was looking. I was like episode 40 and there's these been going out pretty much every week except for like sicknesses. And I think when we were going through the office move in August and September, I didn't do any then. But other than that, it's like coming up on a year. Wow. That I've been doing this. So it's awesome. Yeah. And it's been in a lot of different places. This is like the fourth or fifth studio location. So oh, it'll change again. Yep. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that, <laughs> yeah, too. It's yeah. Change so again. we're going to have to find a new place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. Glad I've been doing it. I'm going to have a basement. It's going to have oh. asbestos tile ceilings. So. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. No, that'll be good. Um, yeah. No, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I started it. It's, I think it's good. Not only get the information out there, but I think it's good for us doing it. Yeah. I think talking about the stuff and then we're talking about what's going on. So we're also kind of learning too. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's good to be friends with your people in the real estate industry. Yeah. Um, I've, I've noticed whenever I was selling in Hampton roads, like even there, I am still selling there. But, um, if you make friends with other agents and you have an offer come across their desk, they are more than likely going to encourage oh, yeah. their, their client to work with you because they're confident in your ability to get it to closing. Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, I know for a fact I had a deal, two deals get done with the same agent essentially because the first deal went so smoothly. The right. second one was kind of a lock. And I'm pretty good with, I mean, one technique that I usually do after a close, if the, I mean, if both sides were pretty good, I'll tell the other agent like, Hey, if you leave me a review, I'll leave you one too. Sure. So, cause I think it's also good to show like your business profile shows that you play well with others. For sure. Um, not just your clients, but lenders, other real estate agents. Um, and I think building those relationships is good. I mean, I had a, a real estate friend of mine come to my open on Sunday and we, she probably sat there and talked with me and my girlfriend for like half an hour and just talking about our different offices, teams, just kind of like what we've been seeing in the market. And I thought that was really good to get a different perspective so that you're not always just talking to the same people in the same office. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like I said, episode 40. Today at the time of recording, it's March 5th, right? March 5th. Oh, Tuesday, March 5th. Says? Yeah, it's Tuesday. Oh my gosh. Tuesday, March 5th. And a, the interest rate for a 30-year conventional fixed rate mortgage is 7.09. 7.09. So realistically, it's like the same exact as it was last week. Yeah. No real movement there. But I mean, you said what? What did you lock in with your VA? Uh, 6.75. Yeah. So, and it should be known too. So the, the stats that we give weekly on that, that is just your national average yeah that doesn't include what your credit situation might be your debt to income the points you've paid for that kind of stuff because i know our lender yeah has still been locking in in the sixes yep so take that with a grain of salt this is why you should always talk to your lender for sure figure out your specific financial situation because yep. yours is not everybody else's yeah and the better your credit score is obviously the better your rate's going to be um based on market rates um and the other thing is you got to con they consider your debt to income ratio um you know it all makes a difference in the interest rate you're going to get so there are variables that are very important yeah and i know so we were talking well i was saying mo all, most of my deals that i've been doing lately have been pretty straightforward so i haven't really had much to talk about but i guess we could get into the fact that today i'm having a remote closing okay and i know a lot of stuff in the real estate world is pretty old fashioned i mean up until covid both parties would be at the closing table signing documents. Now it's like the sellers pre-sign, the buyers come in a week after and they sign. Mm -hmm. So they never actually even see each other. Right. Um, and we're slowly, I think as a product of COVID starting to move a little bit more towards remote closings or yep. a possibility. With our closing, with our title company, Flex Title, that we use at the Pemberton Home Team, they can handle remote closings, but it really comes down to if your lender is able to. Right. So this loan that I'm dealing with right now, they said that they can do remote closing, so that's fine. There was a little back and forth. Who's and actually, the lender on it? Starts with a Z. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> Enough said. Yeah, it's an online company. They, their main thing is not mortgages, but they do mortgages. Sure. Um, 
So they said they can handle remote closings, and I'm sure it's supposed to be going on right now. I was getting some updates that their system might be down, whatever. But the reason I want to bring that up is I think there are some beliefs that you have to be in person to get like your deal done. And really, I mean, this client of mine, I met them at the showing. Mm -hmm. We did the showing together. He loved the house, put an offer. We had a couple, we wanted to put an inspection on it, stuff like that. But he lived in Wisconsin. His fiance is living in Massachusetts. So after that weekend, they went back to where they were living. And I did the inspection with his mom and brother. We had some inspection items, got those taken care of. And then final walkthrough was his dad. And I maybe talked to my client on the phone a couple times. We texted yeah. a couple. And other than that, it was pretty easy. I mean, he, it was just communication with him and his lender, making sure that they were on track with all the documents and stuff. But yes, he was able to do a remote close, mm -hmm. um, which I do think there are some people who think like, oh, I got to have to fly in and out. And it's like, there are people who, there are investors who, never even see the house that yeah. they buy. Yeah. So um, similar to what you, you've you you've done here, I've had in the state of Virginia where I've had a military member getting transferred from out of state mm -hmm. to the area. Um, they obviously aren't there. They're buying homes sight unseen. I have literally done hundreds of video tours through like Facebook yeah. Messenger um, because maybe they have an iPhone and I'm an Android person. Um, so obviously you can't do FaceTime mm -hmm. between the two of those, but Facebook messenger works really, really well for that situation. Um, so I've done lots and lots and lots of video tours to make sure the quality is good. Um, but I've had situations where I'm like, Hey, do you have somebody you trust that can come look at the property? Um, they'll maybe send a shipmate or something like that mm -hmm. or somebody like that to do the, um, to, to view the home because mm -hmm. you can't smell a house on the yeah, video. That, like, yeah. And that's the biggest issue. Yeah. And like when you walk in a house and it's musky or musty or, you know, whatever smell you smell, it's could smell like wet dog, dog urine, cat litter. Like there's so many different smells that could be in a property. So I always recommend to people, if you have somebody that you trust that you can send, please send them. I don't mind doing the video tours, but I'm not responsible for the finished product of what you're buying. Yep. Um, it is completely always up to the individual whether they're going to buy that house or not. Yeah. Um, so I've done the video tours. I've attended the home inspections. That's the other thing is I, I, from what I understand, there's a lot of agents here that don't even go to their home inspections. Yeah. And that's funny too that you mentioned that because the first, so when I was brand new in real estate, I was on a team immediately. Yeah. And I was advised pretty much by the team to not go to inspections. Why? Like, and that's the thing. So I didn't do it. And then when I went solo, I always went. Yeah. And it's so much more beneficial to you and your client if you go to the inspection because one, you know what's going on. Yep. Two, especially for first time home buyers, even a brand new construction home will have pages oh, on yeah. an inspection. There's new house problems. Exactly. And you need to be able to talk your buyer off the ledge, especially if it's a yeah. newer, younger, first time home buyer. They don't know what they're looking at. Yeah. And it's like in today's world, most people are not that handy. So it's like mm -hmm. they get so flustered. Like, what is this? It's like we're talking about replacing a GFCI. It's not a big deal. Yeah. But, or stuff I, like that. I it's tell like, my buyers all the time, like your home inspection is going to make your house look like it's falling apart. Yeah. But look at it as a checklist of things that need to be done after you take ownership. Yeah. And you can order things in importance how you feel it's important. Mm -hmm. If you don't think the, the um, I don't know, the, the windows are sufficient, plan on replacing your windows at some point. Yeah. If you don't like the color of the light switches, plan on switching them out at some point. Um, what I get concerned about is structural stuff, plumbing stuff, heating, cooling, um, major components of the property that make the property useful and that's why i think it's important that agents go so yes. they can sort out what is a real issue and what's just like a lot of things it's like oh your furnace is past its like life like, expectancy date but right. if it's been maintained well and it's in good shape then you probably don't i, I just like if it's way past its expected day, say, hey, maybe just plan to have that in your budget, but it's working just fine. Right. Don't worry about it for right now. Yeah. My big my big thing is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I, I thoroughly believe in that. But on on your note where it's maybe past its life, life expectancy, 
at that point, try and negotiate a home warranty yeah. if the seller's not willing to replace it. Um, and that home warranty will cover that particular item for a year. Yeah. Um, plus additional stuff like your plumbing, your appliances, uh, like if your microwave were to stop working in the middle of the month or after closing or whatever, like you, you could call your uh, home warranty company for that. But um, I've, as a closing gift in the past to my buyers, um, especially during COVID times when the market was bananas and everybody was pretty much waiving the right to ask for repairs, um, back before home ins- our home warranties cost seven hundred dollars, I was buying home warranties for my people. So I That's would, yeah, I, I would spend five hundred dollars and get my people coverage because I felt like, I felt like with the change in the market, my buyers at the time were getting taken advantage of, and I didn't like that. I mean, I was writing in my offers just so they would stand out that if the seller accepted our offer, I would give them a fifty dollar Chick Fil A gift card. And everybody loves the Lord's chicken, so why yeah, not? Yeah. Um, so, and there's a law somewhere that says it's not bribery as long as it's under fifty dollars. <laughs> so yeah. I was just like, it's not bribery. And you know what? We got a lot of la- like a lot of agents really thought it was creative. Yeah. And everybody got a laugh out of it. And I handed out a lot of fifty dollar Chick Fil A gift cards, but mm-hmm. it worked. Yeah. Okay, back to the remote thing. Um, I've had my title company and Virginia Rocket Title, they'll send a remote closer to wherever the their client is or where our client is. Of course, you have to pay for that service, yeah. but they send somebody out to do the closing. So I had a situation in Hampton, Virginia, where um, my old next door neighbor from when I rented a house in Hampton, I was like 21. I was a kid when I rented this house to um, right next to this uh, elderly gentleman and his and his wife. And they loved my dog and my cat. And we essentially were like family. Like we were really good neighbors. He called me and he's like, hey, Amber, I need to sell the house. You know, this is what's going on. Um, So I listed the house. We got it under contract. um, And he was having a really hard time walking. He ended up having to have his foot amputated um, a little later. But um, he literally couldn't make it to the closing office. So rocket title sent a remote closer to his house Mm -hmm. to get the closing document signed. And I was, I made sure I was there with him to make sure that he knew what he was signing. Um, I mean, there's just ways where you don't have to physically go to an office to sign if you're unable to. Yeah. There's so many services out there that, that can just handle it. Yeah. I mean, and that, yeah. And that's all just to say, like we said, there are different solutions for every problem. Just like you said, you do the Facebook messenger walkthrough. I guess I've always done FaceTime, but like you said, that's not an option for you. Um, I've done that. But like you said, the, the only issue becomes is like the smell thing. Yeah. Cause it's like, you can only t- kind of try and describe that to them if they don't have someone there. Right. And if you have animals yourself, more than likely you're going to be nose blind to the seller's animals because i know i am i have a dog and a cat and i am nose blind to some smells because of it yeah yeah so i mean because i've done a couple just through facetime where i didn't even meet the sellers until they move in i mean the buyers until they move in sorry um but yeah that's just to say there are solutions um another thing i know that you want to talk about we kind of talked about before we started filming is just like fair housing stuff because we do get questions and we can talk about the whole gamut of things, but I just wanted to lead off with the question that I get the most that people like don't understand that us agents can't really speak on is like, is how is this a nice school district? Yeah. Nice is such a subjective word. It's a broad term. Yeah. So we're not, we can, your agent should be able to produce some resources for you, connect you some uh, I, I like to send my clients to greatschools.org. Yeah. That. And that'll show like actual quantifiable yeah. statistics on stuff. And they give you like ratings on yeah. those. And then there's like reviews from students and teachers and stuff like yeah. within there that they that they dig up. Um, there's some other sites too. You could literally just go on Google and yeah. like Google school reviews, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And the, the other resources will pop up. But, um, you know, as I'm, as you know, I'm a mom, I have a two year yeah. old. Um, what I consider to be a good school district may not be the same standards Mm -hmm. for somebody else's child. So I have a really hard time telling people, Hey, I think this school district is going to be better for your kid than this school district, because who am I to say what your child should 
should be involved in. That's mm-hmm. not my place. Yeah. Well, and the reason, I mean, the reason we are not supposed to speak on it at all really is has to do, I mean, you don't, any sort of steering, you don't, we won't want to claim yeah. that we've steered our clients to or from an area. Right. Um, and we keep it very factual with yes. stuff that we are able to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, another thing that I get asked a lot is what's the crime like? I can't, we can't even speak on that. Yeah. We can't. So what they're I They're really read, good. Yeah. There are good sites for that. Yeah. Too, they're so. super great sites for that. Um, Google is one of them. You can literally go into Google and type in crime maps for the area. Um, and then interactive maps will literally come up and you can click around and see what streets the issue was on, what type of issue it was. Um, and then the other the other thing that I like to tell my clients is feel free to reach out to the local police department and ask questions, but do not call 911 to ask these questions. That is not the right line to do yeah. it. Um, literally just call like Google the local police department, find their phone number and call them directly and they will get you the information that you're looking for. Yeah. And it's interesting too. another issue that I've come across with different people is cities have more crime than suburban and rural areas. That's oh, yeah. just a fact. So, I mean, there are spots in St. Paul, Minneapolis, which are which I, most people would consider, you know, pretty relatively crime free mm-hmm. for the area. Sure. But it's like down in Lakeville. If you check the sites, that heat map has less is showing less crime than even like the nicer parts of Minneapolis, just because it is data for an entire city. It, right. And that so and I get caught up on that, too, because people will be like, well, this heat map shows us a bunch of crime. Well, it's like if you're in the city, it's just it, it's going to. Yeah, they're just I mean, statistically, there's more crime that happens there. Well, statistically, there's more people that live in the city. So, of course, there's going to be more crime. Exactly. Um, it, it just comes down to um, what you're comfortable as a as a human living. Yeah. Like, are you comfortable being with in the middle of the city where action may happen or would you prefer to be more in the suburbs where it's a little more quieter yeah well that, and that just comes down to like population density and stuff yeah. too so mm-hmm. the other thing like i've i've had it happen not just here but in virginia where somebody finds a house that they really really love online they want to go see the showing i already know that they're not going to like the area just mm-hmm. based on where we've been um, yep. on previous showings but i can't say hey you're not going to like the area i literally cannot say that so we have to physically go to the property and i have to allow them to make that judgment for themselves um which i find i find that is very hard because I am supposed to be working in their best interest and showing them houses that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So where does the line come where I can say, Hey, this based on what we've been looking at, this particular area isn't going to be good, but we can't say that because it's, it's, it's literally steering. Yeah. So what I generally do in this, and maybe this is even uh, some might consider this even borderline, but if it's someone I've been working with for a while and I kind of know what they're looking for and I know their tastes and I say, have you driven past this property before? Yeah. And they'll say no. And then I'll say, do you have any time bef- to just drive by before we go look at it? And they, if they're like, yep, they'll drive by it. And yeah, then they'll tell me. I if- think that's acceptable. Um, I've also had um, situations where I know that the couple may have a young child Mm -hmm. or something like that um and it's not a situation that i would want to live in with my young child Mm -hmm. um so i've in the past encouraged people like hey before we go look at this you need to check the crime maps like look at the crime maps yeah um make sure you're okay with the area before we set the appointment um so i have i have done that in the past and that's kind of like my little moral soul i guess you could say like here's a piece of chocolate like yeah um but it's hard because not everybody reads between the lines Mm -hmm. right um and it's and it's tough because it is our job to to protect people and especially when we know what they're looking for but the house fits everything but maybe the street doesn't yeah so that's what i mean and that's why it's like i have them do a drive-by because if they are uncomfortable driving by it then they're not going to be comfortable living in it. Right. And that's what I say all the time. It's like, and they'll be like, oh, but I love the house so much. And when I, it just comes down to, it's like, you can 
pick the house, but it's like you can't pick the location. Yeah. So it's like if you don't like the location, it's just not going to work. It, so it doesn't matter how much right. you like the house. You're absolutely right. I literally just had that happen like two weeks ago. I was showing a house in, um, in Minneapolis, and the house was absolutely perfect, but it was like on a street that was not. Yeah. And this buyer looks at me and he goes, why does this always happen? And I'm like, Probably your price range. Well, yeah. And he was like, why does this always happen? And I told him, I was like, well, they're trying to gentrify the neighborhood. Like that, that's the truth in it. Somebody yeah. came in here, flipped this property, added to it, made it look nice. And they're selling it for more. Yeah. A lot of times those are just like beginner flippers who mm -hmm. it's like, that was all they could get in their budget. I and mean, they really didn't do any research on the area. Cause a lot of times they'll sit for a long time and yeah. no one ever touches them. Cause yeah, it's like now you've no people moving that area aren't looking to spend that on a house. So they kind of, yeah. And pe and that's the thing is people moving to the area aren't going to know. Yep. And somebody moving to the area is going to buy that house. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's, Everybody deserves a home. Everybody deserves a roof over their head. Everybody deserves yep. safety. And I literally mean everybody deserves that. Yeah. So, yeah. And it like you, like you said, like I said, it really comes down to like, what are you comfortable with? Because mm -hmm. everyone has their own, everyone has their own background. Everyone has, you know, their preferences, what they can afford, what they're willing to tolerate, that kind of thing. Because yep. I've had so many leads come to me and say, they'll say like, have you found like do you have any do you know have anything cheap i'm like what's cheap or like do you do you have anything at a good price is like what's a good price because it's like i don't know your budget yeah so it's like i don't those are just way too general and then half the time they broad. don't even know their budget yeah and they're like no i'm, I'm looking to spend i don't know a hundred dollars a month on a house good luck yeah exactly um so i actually do have one comment uh, that we kind of break it down a little bit so last week, I put out a clip from last week's episode when we were talking about pricing when you're selling and be careful not to overprice, mm -hmm. but maybe just slightly under so you can get more eyes on it, get some bidding war going. And I had a comment that just said, makes no sense. And I guess just to break it down in more detail, when you, let's say your home is worth 450. Yep. Are you, we know market rate 450 all day. If you priced it at, you know, 435. So I have in my head, and this could be wrong slightly. I know other people have different beliefs on this with the exact ranges, but in my head, I have what I call Zillow numbers. Yeah. Where most buyers, if they're not working with an agent, they're looking on Zillow. Mm -hmm. And they're usually setting their budget to like 400, 425. 450. They're usually in like pretty clean increments. Yeah, they're 25,000 increments on where typically. It is so it, like for someone who wants to list their house at like 451, to me I'm like you're missing the 450 we max. Should, we should be under 450. Mm -hmm. But 450 or under. So the reason for that kind of pricing, so let's say someone's budget is up to 450. Well, if you price it at 450, they're probably thinking I'm probably not going to look at that house because if there's any sort of competition, I'm not even going to be because I can't go any higher than 450. Right. Or that's what they're thinking. I don't want to go higher than 450. Let's say you price it at 435. They're like, okay, we have some room there. Then they go see it. They fall in love with it because now you've gotten them. It, you've got that over that psychological hurdle. And they're like, okay, now it's worth seeing. So I'll go see it. Right. And then when they are in it, they're like, oh, I love this house. They go and put an offer, let's say, for 445 Right. Escalation clause included. Or not. Even though I'm just saying, like, right yeah. away. And then they say, okay, we have multiple offers. We're calling for highest and best. Your guys' this was not the best. If you'd like to come up, like, let me know. They're talking with their lender. They go over it. And the lender is like, well, technically, you could go up to 465 mm -hmm. So then they're thinking, well, fuck. Like, if we could get it at 455 mm -hmm. we would still want this house. Right. Because before they didn't love it. Now they've seen it. They love it. And now they're thinking, all right, How, well, let's we'll do anything we can. Yeah. To get it. Let's let's offer 455 or let's offer 450 with an escalation up to 455. Yeah. So now you got someone who was originally not going to look at it. Yep. Now you've got them in the house and now they're making offers and now you're getting that 455 when before you weren't going to get that offer at all. Yep. And that's just the one. So in there, 
I mean, the reason they had to go up is because they're competing with other people who are in the same situation. Yep. That's how you got more eyes on the property. And the reason that you want to do that right away, as opposed to someone saying, well, Blair, why don't I just start at 475 and then work my way down to that? So the issue with that is, let's say if you thought you'd get 450, but you're like, you know what, let's go 475, who knows? And then I could land at 450. The thought process of the consumer today is they don't want to waste time. No, they don't. And the other thing is, is if you overprice the property, it's going to stay on the market longer. And then it gets the rep of what is wrong with this house? Why hasn't anybody bought it? Mm -hmm. Is it haunted? Does the toilet not flush? Or is the kitchen bad? Does the refrigerator work? And then you go finally get your offer. You got your home inspection and then stuff's wrong. And the buyer's like, oh, I'm overpaying for the house. You know, the refrigerator doesn't work. That's $15,000. Like that's literally yeah. the the mindset there is how much can I get off of the property? Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're in a bidding war, it's how do I win the property? What yeah. do I have to give up to win the property? Yeah. Because the, well, the issue is going to become your price at 475. You thought you could get 450, but you wanted to milk every dollar ever that you could. Mm -hmm. So you came out 475. It sits for a long time because again, consumers, if they're only approved up to 450, 55 they're not it's not even worth their time to go see it so they're not going to waste their time to go look at it right until it's been on the market now for months because you haven't sold it because of everyone's mindset they're not going to go look at it because they can see other homes in the area and they know it's not worth that much well now that person who is going to waste their time doing it they're going to price gouge you they are and then more than likely here's the, here's the tactic that i tell my buyers all the time houses that have been on the market for 30 plus days those sellers are more than likely going to give you your closing costs that you need. So we don't need to be looking at houses that are brand new on the market. We need to look at stuff that's been sitting. Yeah. That's, they, that's they smell blood in the water. They know you're desperate because yeah. I mean, there are various different situations, but I would think the most common situation for a seller is you've bought a new home. Mm -hmm. Now you want to sell your old home. Well, now if you were able to purchase a new home without selling the old one, now you're paying two mortgages. If you weren't, you're sitting there, you can't get into your new home because you're, it's contingent on the, uh, the sale of your old home. And now you've got a seller who's pissed off at you because your home's not selling. So it just becomes a situation where it's not ideal for you. So the person who does come along, you're going to be dragging your feet, but you're probably going to give them everything they want. Yep. And it might not even be 450 at that point. Right. You might end up actually netting 440 or 430 because yeah. you overpriced it. Yeah. Yep. And then you also don't want to help. Ugh. You don't want to land yourself in a situation where, let's say, you came on at 475. Two weeks later, you go down to 465. Yep. You don't get any offers. You, then, then you drop to 455. Later, yep. Because when that happens, people are asking what's wrong with the house. Yep, they're asking what's wrong with the house. And then they see that you're willing to negotiate because you dropped your price down. Exactly. They see you are willing to go lower. Yep. And now they're going to want to find out what is your lowest. So one of my favorite things, uh, I have an investor that I work with in Virginia. One of my favorite things that he does is he lists like, let's say 450, right? That's the, that's what we come back at is what it's supposed to be listed at. Mm -hmm. He'll list at 449-997. I think that's so annoying. But. Well, the reason he does it is because it's memorable. Right. The yeah. number is then memorable. So the buyer will go, hey, do you remember that house that was listed at the 997? Like that is it's a it's a mind game to get people into the property. Yeah. And um, I've heard that, too. Yeah. So it's literally and that's an investor. It's an investor thing like that. Yeah. It's literally like, how do I make my listing stand out outside of being unique? Mm -hmm. It's with the list price. That's yeah. how you make your listing stand out. Price fixes everything. Yeah. Yep. And like I said, too, it's. So again, you just never want to be chasing the price down. And th something that drives me nuts is sometimes based on seller mentality as an agent, you can just never win. Because mm -hmm. I have, and I heard this, someone said this to me the other day, and I, and I just shook my head because they said, yeah, well, the last time, the last time they sold their house, it sold that same weekend like in multiples. And I think they're just traumatized by that situation because they thought they could have gotten more. And what? And I've noticed that is a consumer bias where they think if the house sells too quickly, they think it was priced too low and that they should have priced it higher. Yeah. But if you're, if the house is on too long and doesn't sell, they're pissed at the agent because the house isn't selling. Yep. My thing is if they had a 
perfect pricing model, it should go in the first weekend. And that's not a downfall. And that's not. And your agent deserves a raise. Yeah. As I say, they did their job. They did their job and it only took up a weekend of your life that you had to be out for showings. And that's, it drove me nuts to hear that because what I heard is you got multiples. It went for over list Mm -hmm. and it was done in a weekend. What was, what was traumatizing about that? What more could you ask for? And that, and that was nuts to me. And it's just like, there is this consumer thing. It's like, well, you're, if you only, if you only had to work for a weekend, then you weren't working hard enough. I think my, made me think of a story. Um, so when COVID just started happening, I took a listing in Hampton, Virginia, and we had the, it was like literally the first time, like the market exploded and we had 24 offers in two days. Yeah. 24. Mm -hmm. And we ended up going for, I don't know, $20,000 over list price. But anywho, like my sellers were so happy that it went so quickly and they were able to just make it like seamless to get into their new property, which was less than seven miles away from their current home. But those things happen. Like you have to price it appropriately to get that kind of action. Well, and you're not paying an agent per hour and you shouldn't want to. No. You should want that. If they're doing their job right, it should go quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's. That, and then I think people think like they were robbed of money because it didn't take that long. Like they, they're like, well, what did I pay for? It's like you paid to get it sold at yeah. a high price. Yeah. So And quickly yeah, that, at that, that to move on with your life. Yeah. So that drove me nuts. Yeah. Um, that's fair. Well, this has been another episode of the Real Estate Sit Down. Thanks for joining us. Please like, subscribe, turn on notifications, comment on the post. That's add probably my favorite part is breaking down the comments. Yes. Yeah. Add us on other social media. Um, As always, I am Blair Berg, and this is Amber Perez. Thank you for joining us. Thanks.